really, really interested. We're really interested uh, in uh, the marrying of both uh, trade considerations and uh, uh, the innovative part of using uh, blockchain in the uh, Miriato B two B international. Uh, uh, database. Um, our innovation uh, network is made possible uh, by um, made possible by MNP, and I want to thank MNP very much uh, for our uh, quarterly uh, meetings. Uh, MNP is represented by Amanda Bolton here today, Alice Bolton, and Sharag uh, Vasa. Uh, welcome to all of our guests. I see that Jose has joined us from the World Trade uh, Center. Luz joined us uh, from uh, Lawrence's. Um, and uh, uh, I hope you all enjoy the presentation. Please feel free to uh, ask uh, lots of uh, questions. There, uh, I, I do not have any pecuniary uh, interest in uh, Mariado. I simply think it's a great idea. Part of our mandate as Chambers of Commerce uh, are to help startups tell their story. And uh, uh, they have a compelling business proposition for Chambers of Commerce, a revenue stream uh, as well, that uh, they'll tell us about a little bit later as well. So uh, at this point, I uh, will uh, turn the podium over to Sharad Vasa. He is a partner at uh, MNP. Uh, MNP MNP, again, has been a strong supporter of the Brampton Board of Trade, its innovation uh, network, uh, and uh, um, he will provide the uh, official introduction of our guests today, Nicholas Forzi and uh, Jerome Osher. Sharag, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. MNP is dedicated to supporting businesses in the advanced manufacturing sector as they grow and innovate. It has always been important to us and it is still important to us to support manufacturers through the challenges and opportunities of the evolving business landscape. We became involved with the Innovation Network to help ensure that the continued success of manufacturing operations in Brampton are carried on. Our blockchain technology team has experienced has experience with both public and private audits in the cryptocurrency space of for funds, exchanges, and mining companies, as well as blockchain technology companies. We also work with several innovation centers and labs with blockchain startups across Canada. As a firm with a deep entrepreneurial spirit, we pride ourselves on being on the leading edge of innovation. The team helped forge accounting and auditing frameworks for the crypto sector, we spend time with regulators educating them on the cryptocurrency and the blockchain concepts and work with re regulators to help businesses navigate uncharted waters. We have been dedicated, we have dedicated blockchain work, working groups across the country that meet regularly to consider new areas in the blockchain space and provide updates on the rapid and constant regulatory changes. We encourage you to visit MNP Business Insights at mnp.ca to ensure that you keep up to date and that you have and receive up to date and relevant content related to this topic and other areas for the sector as well. With that, I would like to introduce uh, Nicholas Forsey and Jerome Osher. From, uh, they, have, they have founded Mariado as a vetted B2B marketplace exclusively designed for, cham for chamber members. Nicholas started. Um, Nicholas started his career at J.P. Morgan Chase in London as a financial analyst in 1995, before performing his military service as an officer in French Territorial Army in 2000. Thank you for your services, Nicholas. Um, he then entered the media industry as an award-winning producer before moving to the UAE, where he served as a chief creative officer of a video agency for the better part of the decade. He then set up a, as a digital strategy consultant for the world's free zones organization before joining McKinsey as a communication expert. He's a graduate of the London School of Economics and Harvard University Extension School. Jerome spent over 15 years in the International Chamber of Commerce ecosystem. He started as a trade co uh, coordinator in the Paris headquarters, then moved to the UAE to head international relationships for the Dubai Chamber of Commerce and Industry before becoming a director of ICC UAE in 2016. He's set up as an independent consultant in 2020, serving both corporate and public sector clients across Europe and the Gulf. He currently advises the UN Global Compact of the Saudi Arabia Network Strategy. 
Jerome holds a degree from the ESCE uh, International Business School and U University Patreon Sorbonne and the University of London. Welcome, Nicholas and Jerome. I'll to you now. Thank you very much for this uh, for this thank great you, introduction, and uh, thank you very much, Todd, um, for for hosting us and and to your team. Um, I want to give a particular uh, shout out to our, our lady um, ladies in the audience <coughs> on the, on this special day. And uh, today we have for you a, a presentation that tries to cover as many of the topics that were raised uh, that uh, that are relevant to to you as an audience. Um, we're veering on the on the side of companies more than chambers uh, for the for the most part of our presentation, but we'll be open to discussing more specific chamber related. Uh, aspects of our of our value proposition at the end. Um, as Todd said, feel free to, to to chime in with questions at any point, and we're going to try to make this interactive a little bit. So um, feel free also to uh, to be active on Zoom to to annotate and, and put your stamp on on certain things when we ask you uh, for your opinion, because that would be uh, that would be very very helpful and engaging. So without further ado, I will pronounce the immortal words of Zoom of uh, Let me share my screen. Um, which we're now all familiar with. And uh, so what, what we propose to do with you today is to, is to look at the future of B2B trade, uh, the ideal future that we would like to, to build um, and to involve you in, in that process and, and to spe specifically focus on, on the world of B2B, which a lot of people kind of take for granted but don't, don't necessarily acknowledge as, as, a, as a, particular, uh, a particular ecosystem. Um, so for that, I'll let Jerome introduce the 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 market itself and then we'll we'll pick up back and forth as uh, as we go jerome okay, sure thank you nicholas uh, we all you probably know but the the online b2b market uh, um, is expected to boom within the next three years with 12 trillion dollars of of as a market um we know as well the the pandemic has accelerated that focus uh with you know 90 percent of decision makers ex expecting online B2B to become the norm for overall procurement. But it also reflects uh, a shift into the spendings where three quarter of B2B decision makers expect uh, uh, their procurement to be online within three years. And this also affects their spendings with half of them expecting to spend uh, 50,000 US dollars and one third of them expect to spend half a million dollars. And so, it is technically the, 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 the real time, the right time for companies to start shifting their procurement, but also their, their, their visibility as, as a trader on a global online platform. Now, the, the, thing, the thing to understand about the B2B versus B2C is that they're, they're different markets, but there is a convergence that, that is, is slowly coming into play. The, the, the B2B... Um, commercial experience is somewhat fragmented online, uh, whereas the B2C is fairly, fairly fluid, fairly integrated, and has, uh, has, has been polished to a certain uh, more advanced degree. It tends to the fact that th there are two different types of, of transaction spaces. In B2B, you're talking about larger amounts. Uh, the amounts that Jerome mentioned per transaction to be taken online are, are significantly larger than B2C. That carries a higher form of risk, particularly since there are large amounts, but also there are fewer of those transactions taking place per, per any given year, as opposed to B2C, where we can just you know, purchase th something on the fly uh, on our way home. And B2B also has fairly complex compliance attached to it. Uh, there's a lot, of, a, lot of other, a lot of hoops that we have to jump to to, to remain compliant when we uh, carry out B2B transactions. And those burdens are not on the B2C space. However, because a lot of, uh, in fact, the large majority of procurement professionals are now um, millennials and are uh, of, a, of a younger uh, cohort, they are expecting the fluidity of the B2C experience online when it comes to B2B. And that raises the bar for, for what needs to happen in the B2B space and, and is as partly motivated, Jerome and I, in our in, in the venture that we'll, we'll speak to you a little more as we progress. Now, can digital and trust work together? Can we digitalize trust? Um, we 
you know, chambers have been doing providing trust for trade for centuries. And we don't think that necessarily trust can be digitalized. We've made a test with Nicholas on several marketplace uh, uh, due to the anonymous uh, of, of technology, you can create a fake account with a fake company uh, uh, uploading fake product and trying to sell it to a real buyer. And that's an issue. Um, and so, you know, vetting, and, and when there is a vetting, some marketplaces are offering vettings. That vetting is usually against a high fee. And so there is a potential conflict of interest or the vetting is uneven or bias. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the, the, the trust is not complete. And so authenticity is key. And while we believe that trust cannot be digitalized, digitized, the result of trust can be. And that's because chambers provide that trust that can in, in afterwards be translated on the marketplace. Now, Nicholas will explain me later. Well, we'll tell you a little bit more about Marietta a, a little bit later. We're just setting the context for, for the elements that need to, to affect a, a particular B2B marketplace. And by marketplace, as, as Tom mentioned in the chat, we mean things like Alibaba and, or, or Amazon. Um, in, in a B2B transaction that takes place on such a marketplace, vetting is, is uh, essential. And it's essential um, that it takes place over a standardized process, something that is the same or at least similar for every person involved. The vetting process that we see right now is very different across the different marketplaces and platforms. And that's a problem because you can't trust it. It also needs to be something where the result of that vetting is someone that everyone recognizes as valid. So uh, again, the, the example of a chamber verifying that a company is active is a vetted process that is um, acceptable as in its, uh, in its outcome. And it is even more acceptable because it is based on a common set of values amongst the different members of chambers across different regions and, and across the world. Though the methods may differ in their checking of the companies they onboard as members, the chambers nevertheless are trustworthy as an entity making that vetting happen. And so the, if, if the digital business transactions that can take place must be built on trust. And this kind of trust that Chambers provide is one that we are particularly focusing on uh, for, our, for our venture. And we wanna now, have, yeah, yeah, please go on, Nicholas. No, no, I was, well, we're, we're both eager to find out um, in, uh, in, in, your, uh, in your opinion, what do, you, what do you feel would be the, the biggest obstacles that vendors uh, may uh, face to grow sales? And um, one that we have identified is one of visibility. Of course, in order to grow sales, you need to be visible where your buyers are. And that means being on the right platforms or on the right trade spaces. The other one is one of credibility. You need people to choose you as a vendor over other people and to have the data or the uh, information they need to do so. You also need to combat the complexity of growing your sales as a vendor that may come as a, at a a particular as a particular hurdle so things like paperwork things like um, uh, uh, licenses or, or, or certain types of, of uh, regulations but also there is the affordability of doing that uh, of, of addressing the visibility credibility and complexity aspects that may get in the way in, in your opinion if you want to use the the annotate tool or the chat in, uh, in zoom what would you say is the biggest hurdle to growing sales as a, as a vendor online or shout out, actually, if you will, if you prefer. This is where we gauge who the morning people are. <laughs> good morning, good morning. I, I may just shout out as opposed to- uh, Please, yeah. It, it, it is certainly, um, uh, we provide uh, mission critical cooling systems and we ship that product worldwide. That okay. product then needs to be installed in the host country with a series of different trades in the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing. So uh, certainly your, um, the idea of being able to vet the, those that will interact through the sales process and the supply of product and services in host countries is essential to us and, and quite valuable to have a platform that would allow that vetting to take place um, is substantial. 
Right. So that would be the, the credibility aspect of, of the people involved, right? Yes. So thank you. Thank you, John, for, for, for mentioning that. And uh, is, it, is it Tyrrell or, Ty or am I pronouncing it correctly? Just by Ty is just fine by me. Ty Tyrell? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Just, I don't want to butcher people's names <laughs> this early in the morning. Uh, you mentioned ease, ease of transaction, which I assume is related somewhat to the complexity aspect. Absolutely. So whether, whether it's easy with a couple of clicks to carry out the transaction will make a difference uh, to, to how easy it is to grow sales for vendors, yes? So, and, and these are indeed two, two, two important dimensions. The, the takeaway that we found in, in our research uh, is in, in the preparation of our venture is that all of these aspects can be solved with the right um, platform. So when it comes to visibility, the very fact that you're on the right platform, which has the right reach for you is, is a big step forward, but also with the platform of, uh, provides the right search parameters for you to be found and for you to tailor your, or your offering in order to be found is, uh, is important. The credibility aspect is definitely something that uh, you can uh, you can address with the right platform because of the vetting process that uh, that you can provide, um, and in in our case, Marietto is one as as Tom mentioned that is a, a marketplace built for chamber members only, meaning that only companies that are registered with a chamber may take part. You cannot just rock up and and uh, and create an account; it has to go through your chamber. And that vetting process ensures the credibility of the people that you deal with. And as Joanne mentioned, since it's very often an important part of the equation, that's, that's addressed this way. There are other elements like ratings that, that are found in, on some other uh, platforms and that are also an important part of the equation. And things like badges, of uh, the, you've seen those on, on Amazon, for example, or on eBay, the super sellers, the people who have done this over and over again, they have the credibility of a track record. The complexity aspect can be solved on, the, on a digital format by creating a user experience, a user interface that is as fluid as the B2Cs that we know. And ideally, that is fully integrated from end to end. And that's also a part that we'll, we'll address a little bit later, but that is currently missing. The, the notion that you can do all of the transaction from the very beginning, searching for the right partner, all the way to the conclusion of that transaction online on a platform. And then finally, the affordability can be solved online because a lot of these platforms provide a, a predictable cost. Fewer provide a low annual fee. We are one of them. We'll, we'll talk more about that as well. Uh, but as you can see, all these different factors, which may be hurdles and challenges to build sales, can all be overcome very, very easily with the, uh, the, the uh, use of a, a right, the right digital platform. Now, the other things that platform offer are uh, a lot of data and data when turned into analytics. So when, when organized and properly formatted and, and properly anonymized, because we have to stay ethical about it, we can't just pry on people's business. Uh, they, they can offer you a, uh, the, the power of a better business decision. But for that to happen, the analytics that you find on these platforms have to be, first of all, precise. Um, if they're just big average trends, that's not very helpful. But if they're a little bit more granular uh, and provided that way, then that, that, becomes, that becomes more interesting. They have to be reliable. So they have to be based on ideally actual transactions um, that are on the same platform as uh, the, the one that provides the analytics. And that way there is no discontinuation of, uh, of the, the chain of information. It also has to be relevant to you. Uh, you need to be able to access the right types of analytics that you want, because uh, if, uh, if the only ones that you have access to are too broad or, or too narrow in the wrong space, it doesn't matter. Because with these, you need to have something that is actionable, something you can use to make the decision you need. And ideally for that decision to then lead to a transaction on that very same platform. Right? Now, the, what analytics also provide is a, an, an opportunity to dig a little deeper. And that's uh, using artificial intelligence and tools from artificial intelligence, which are um, 
uh, things like machine learning and deep learning. I'll, I'll touch base really quickly on that for, for those of you uh, who, who, who may desire to know a little bit more. If you think about artificial intelligence as a computer mimicking the logical process of, of the human mind, but extending it to a data set that is larger than any human could potentially grasp, that's, that's the, the, the broad definition of artificial intelligence. It's programmed and it follows a certain pattern. Machine learning is a subset of that. It's a subset of, of AI whereby you, you send the computer out on a, on a sort of errand to look for patterns in data with a particular kind of framework in mind so that it looks for certain patterns and comes back to you when it has found them. And then within that, you have deep learning where you just throw a large data set at uh, at, a, at a piece of software and ask it to find whatever patterns it may, it may see in there. Now, all of these are, are uh, uh, usable and actionable if the data that you supply to them is relevant and with a marketplace that extracts transaction data that you can then use with the right set of tools to extract certain patterns of trade, certain uh, sector-specific pieces of information that allow you to move strategically, then you have an edge. And if that platform is the right one, then you can use that edge to carry out more transactions on that very same marketplace. So since we're on the, uh, on the subject of, uh, of analytics, um, another, another quick check-in for you. What, what would you say are the analytics that, that you need if, uh, if, you had, if you had a choice? Um, would you say that you would want things, oops, sorry. Would you say that you want things about your own business? Would you want to have a view on your competitors' businesses? Would you want a view of your, of your geographical territory or the market that you're in? Or would you want um, a, a view of the, the likely future, a trend coming uh, that, that you may not be aware of? Again, feel free to shout out, use the chat, use the annotate tool, which, uh, whichever you feel comfortable with. All of the above. <laughs> That's a good start. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, hey, if you have a smorgasbord, why do you want to choose? It's a good point. If, if, you, had to pick, if you had to pick one, that you would have over the others or that you would have before the other the three, which one would it be? Nicholas, if I may, I have certain clients who do online selling basically, but also do yep. sell to you know, B2Bs as well. And uh, I think one thing that they always want to know is how competitive they are from a pricing standpoint. So, mm -hmm. uh, because that's the piece where I feel that, you know, buyers today have a lot of options and, and they want to make sure that they're getting the best price for, for what they're purchasing for. Right. So that's the, from the point of view of, of sellers. They want to know if their prices are in line with the market, where they stand compared to their, uh, the, the, the competitors in the same market, right? And, and would you say that's across territories? Yeah, across territories yeah. too. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, yeah, what, what we're getting as a, as a uh, we're getting a little bit of the competitor's aspect as, as rising a, a above, but I think everyone agrees that all of these are precious elements of information that you would want. And, and I think that you would also agree that a lot of, uh, a lot of platforms provide you with some breakdown of what you already do there. And that's in large part due to the fact that that's your private information. So there's no issue sharing that back to you. That's a little bit of value add. But where it becomes interesting is when you can have an aggregated view of your competitive landscape, whether in your market globally or in the territory that you operate in specifically. And then from there, extrapolate future trends for your competitors, for your market and for your territory, right? Now, all of these are things that can be extracted from transaction data and a platform that tracks transaction data properly and that then shares it back to its users will provide the combination of those insights that all of you are, are, uh, are eager to access. And, uh, and here again, I, we will have good news for you in, in, in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to let um, 
Jerome, pick up from uh, from me for the uh, uh, for the next slide as we, yeah, as we continue. Yeah, you know, on each B two B platforms, paperwork can be um, a shortcoming, can be a problem, um, and this is due to the fact that um, they are not really uh, uh, incorporated into the platforms like it, and because as well, the, the scope is 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 also a bit more shallow in the sense that. There's less paperwork required for B2C than for B2B. And so a lot of B2B platform don't cover that transaction document uh, uh, journey. Um, and we additionally, there is no global, globally used uh, uh, compliance standard for, for documents. And so as soon as you start trading with a foreign country, you might face some uh, difficulty of aligning with your partner on which document to use. Uh, finally, there is, it's not always easy and secure to share uh, uh, documents and or companies are not confident to do so. And that's one of the, uh, uh, the, the platforms that our platform will be blockchain structured. And therefore, Nicholas will develop a little bit more on, on this uh, uh, later. But most of the, the platforms are actually unreliable when it comes to the storage because you don't have we don't know when they are stored. Um, now I want to deep dive a little bit about the trade documentation aspect. Um, a lot of the, the, the B2B platforms are not offering, as I said, a comprehensive transaction document. When you start exporting, there are a numerous list of documents that you might be required from um, certificate of origin to customs declaration, insurance, trade finance, and all of these uh, a transaction will most of the time be conducted outside of a B2B platform. And so you are actually not relying on one single window to, uh, to conduct your entire transaction. And there might be as well some, some difficulties to coordinate uh, uh, between those, all of these documents. Now, most of the B2B platforms are offering you know, RFP, invoice, payment receipt. And so the issue is there is no one-stop shop for globally compliant, exhaustive documentation. <coughs> so that's it. That's essentially that's essentially what's missing. And and if if you are able to access the analytics that we described, and if you are able to combine that with the right compliant paperwork, and and the trail that comes with that, the history that comes with that, that can lead to access to a number of trade finance solutions. And, and these can range from traditional finance solutions from, from traditional banks, which will look upon the, uh, the data that you have accumulated on a platform where transactions are carried out this way. And on the compliant paperwork that you also have linked to those transactions very favorably and will therefore extract better terms for you. They will also be um, applicable to fintech solutions such as the ones that we're in, uh, in, in the long-term interested in, which is peer-to-peer -peer amongst companies. A lot of companies have a demand for um, uh, CapEx um, cash flow that can match certain excess uh, capital reserves that other companies have that they may want to put to work. And there are ways to, to combine the analytics and the reliable compliant paperwork of transactions to create the the um, uh, the bedrock of a peer-to-peer -peer financing transaction as well. All of these can eventually be tied back to a, a similar marketplace platform that tr that hits all those uh, all those elements, and those elements work together. Now we talked about uh, blockchain very briefly, and it's been mentioned by by Todd uh, early on, and, uh, and in our introduction the notion of blockchain is one that is usually associated to crypto. Most people think blockchain, they think Bitcoin, and they think little beyond that. I understand that from, from the, uh, the information that's, uh, that uh, you have access to, that you know that it goes far beyond that. Uh, it also captures things like NFTs, which are you know, in the same kind of world as crypto, but, uh, but are starting to, to expand the scope. 
Blockchain is also something that can be used with um, uh, official records, such as accounting records or any form of legal records like deeds uh, and, and things like that. But they can also apply to transaction documentation. This is where it gets interesting because the approach that we choose to take with our marketplace is one where the paperwork of an entire, the entire paperwork of a transaction is stored on a blockchain and accessible by the two parties involved in that transaction. And those two parties may then choose who they share these materials with. And because of the blockchain structure, this is very easy to do and is very easy to also extract from there anonymized information that can be used to build the analytics we described before. Now, before we move on, I just want to clarify one thing about blockchain. Um, you may have heard the terms public and private associated to blockchain. The public format of blockchain, uh, Ether being the most uh, recognizable one, is one where anybody can join. Everyone has a, a copy of a, digital, of a, a distributed ledger, an, an account of all the transactions that take place on that database, on that blockchain. And, and anyone is, is free to come in and come out and to validate any transaction that takes place on that blockchain. That's interesting for a lot of things, but not necessarily for transactions, which need to have a privacy element as well. A private blockchain is one where you can still um, validate anything on the, that, that takes place on that blockchain, any transaction. You can only join, however, if you are validated by one of the operators of the blockchain. However, once you're in, everybody has the same rights. And then there's a hybrid, which is one that is particularly relevant to transaction documents, which is a permissioned blockchain. And that is one where not only are you filtering who gets in, but you're also allocating different rights to different people within that blockchain so that you compartmentalize the visibility of data to the different parties depending on their user rights. So if, if for example, we're only talking about chamber members, you can give to the chambers on that network a particular set of rights and, and access, but then to the different members of each of the chambers, a separate set of rights that are perhaps more restricted to what they, what they need to, to operate. So in, in that respect, blockchain provides a very appealing and uh, interesting solution to the, the problem of tracking paperwork in a compliant and reliable manner. Yeah, Jeremy, you there is an accessibility? Sure, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, there is an essential part uh, uh, for trade, which is accessibility. And uh, clearly now we, we, you know, we, are, we are used to uh, uh, be able to have access to B2C platforms in multiple language you know, covering the world. Uh, and it, it should also be the case for B2B. Uh, and so our platform uh, is available in 40 language and can allow multiple location and vendors can have their own uh, platforms with their own languages, which is accessible by counterparts in their own language. And as well as multiple platform in the sense that it should be more always mobile friendly so that, for example, uh, a manufacturer in his factory can uh, uh, pursue a transaction while remaining, you know, directly on the factory line with his, um, probably with his phones and following a transaction uh, uh, directly and not being able to, uh, to be, for example, in, in front of, in an office. And so an omni-channel access, which is inclusive, is essential for trade. So to summarize, what ideally we want to build in the future for you based on, on what you said you're looking for in terms of analytics, what you are, are recognizing as obstacles to grow sales. On a, on a digital B2B marketplace, what you would want is only vetted users. So uh, it, it, with a process that you recognize as valid and that, has, uh, that, that is reliable, you would want actionable analytics to be available to you, to be based on the transactions that take place on that platform so that the, the the quality is, is maintained. There is no discrepancy across the chain of information. You would want a simple user experience and user interface, one that is reminiscent of B2C, the comfort that it brings with it and the fluidity that, it's, that it offers. You would want compliant paperwork based on global standards. Again, things that are internationally recognized and stored and accessible 
in a way that is uh, using blockchain to make this both private yet shareable to the extent that you desire. And you would want this to be affordable so that it doesn't put a dent in your, uh, in your business before it starts. And of course, you don't just want it to be local, you want it to be global, right? So when you have all of this, you are, you are pretty much ahead of the crowd. And um, this has been a, a very long introduction to tell you that essentially that is exactly what we, what we offer. We are a, uh, we're building as a startup a, a B2B marketplace that is only for vetted members of, uh, it, which are chamber members. It is one where the entire set of documents across a transaction are available as, as templates for users to complete. They are pre-filled based on the user information profiles, and then they can be completed by the users at will or added to with additional documents if they wish. And they are stored on a blockchain structure, a permission blockchain structure that allows this to, uh, to be reliably stored and accessible at any time. And it is built in an omni-channel uh, approach across languages, across uh, devices, so that uh, anyone can access that all over the world in the language of their choice and is able to use that to transact with any other member of a chamber across any other territory uh, that is a member of our network so that we in effect enable uh, in a very fluid B2B experience throughout. And I'll let Jerome conclude with the vision that we have for the, for the growth of the platform before we open up for questions. Jerome? Yeah, so we are currently, uh, uh, you know, been in, in discussion with over 20 countries, 20 national chambers of commerce, uh, who, with whom we are uh, in negotiation with uh, at the agreement level. Um, the, uh, we're planning to have the uh, platform live by the last quarter of this year. Uh, so we're building the platform as we speak um, with the purpose of expanding trading routes uh, from the first uh, joiners. Uh, so for example, in the case of Canada, we would you know, foster with the US, the NAFTA, and probably uh, uh, some key Asian countries as well as in Europe. Um, we will also in our development grow, further growth and maturity stage include more product and services that chambers offer like mediation or, or other type of, of chamber services. And our, our long-term purpose is to basically connect businesses to trade across every chambers in the world to be the only marketplace you need for all your B2B transactions. Um, and so with this, uh, that concludes with our, with our presentation. And we'll open for questions or comments. I have a, a question. Please, Jeff. Um, so I'm pretty familiar with blockchain from the crypto side of things. Um, yep. And I was very interested. Um, so I, I assume you're going for like an ERC style system. Um, would you guys be also facilitating smart contracts between companies on the B2B to do automation? Uh, yes, but there's, there's a compliance aspect that we have to respect on that, on that front. Okay. So the, the, uh, the, because there's certain things that require checks and, and that right. you can automate, but it, it can be very dangerous to do that. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, over the, yeah. But um, with the, the uh, platform we're going to be using is Hyperledger Fabric uh, for, okay. uh, for, the, for the blockchain structure. And the way we want to have it is the uh, uh, the nodes validating transactions will be the chambers. Okay. And then so the members the will be, yeah. And then okay. um, it, because it maintains the, the dynamic that is the chamber to member, which is already in mm -hmm. place. And, and so it, it preserves that as our network of, of chambers grows. And uh, it also alleviates a little bit of, of processing burden on the, on the members, uh, keeps things fairly simple. And the way we want to do it is uh, to, if you want to get a little bit technical, is to uh, sure. uh, have the uh, um, the hash of the documents stored on uh, the blockchain that everyone can access, but have a separate storage that the hash points to for the documents themselves on on our servers uh, separately. And that may or may not be uh, uh, blockchain built, depending on the efficiency of the system that will observe. Sure, that it would reduce the burden, right? Because that, that's exactly. a lot to store in the blockchain. Okay. Yeah. 
The other thing Very about cool. using chambers is that we can use proof of authority as a yep. validating uh, protocol, which again is lighter on hardware and, uh, and, and makes, it, makes it for a smoother experience. Very does, cool. does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. Okay. Scott, you had certificate of origins. Yes, so very good point. So how do we partner and how do we work with partners is, is I think the broader scope of your question, Scott. But it, the, the idea is that there will be many things that Marriott will offer users that are in place with third parties. I mean, the most natural thing is shipping and payment. Those are already farmed out in, in most B2B platforms. In the case of shipping to places like UPS, FedEx, and, um, and DHL. Uh, payments, everybody's heard of Stripe and things like that. Um, what we want to do is do the same and extend that to other services such as the ones that Chambers provide. And we want to do so at cost. I want to do so for two reasons. First, for, co for, for cost transparency for users, because that way they're not tempted to go outside the platform to get something cheaper. It's, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's um, much, much easier to just stay on the platform, do it for the same price. And the second thing is, um, we also want to focus our revenue, uh, uh, our, our revenue stream on subscriptions only. So we don't want to drive revenue through the transaction volume. On the contrary, we want to keep it as a fixed cost to keep it predictable for the users. Mm -hmm. And that way, as, as you grow your business through us, the cost of that progressively diminishes compared to the revenue that you're generating. And so it becomes a, a kind of a self-fulfilling virtuous circle to use the platform and to stay on it. Uh, so to be specific about your question on certificates of origin, um, yes, these are services that can be provided through Marriotto, but handled by the parties that provide it. So in, in the case that you mentioned, the Canadian Chamber. Um, but we certainly, if there is a cost associated, would not take a commission on that. Does that cover your, your question? Yes, thank you. Certainly. Would you also be, sorry. Yep, go ahead. Would you also be facilitating a chain of custody for uh, goods so that uh, a big one that's been coming up a lot is um, conflict goods and um, the origin of just say, you know, clean metal or dirty metal uh, when it comes to the manufacturing market, uh, like tracking that through the blockchain so there's a chain of custody? Well, the thing is because because we're ambitious and we want, to be, we want to be all things to all people, that will take time. And that's certainly something that we want. Th those are the kind of things that we want to integrate within, uh, within the, the platform. But we, in order for the, the process to remain fluid, this has to be an option that users may choose. So to, to, to go very quickly through the, the transaction process, you want, to, um, you, want to, you, you want to buy, I don't know, uh, uh, large quantities of uh, copper, for example, um, you're looking for uh, a vendor. You send out an RFP on Marriott. That goes out to the users that have flagged that they are open to RFPs. Some respond. One has the terms that you, that you want. You're ready to step up to the LPO stage. The LPO is a template that pops up pre-filled with both parties' information as, as they have filled it on Marriott. At that point, and throughout every stage of the transaction process, you may choose to use that template as is, to complete it with additional information or to add to it at that particular step an additional document that may not be a template we provide. And so at one stage in that process, there will be the option of, do you want to track the origin of that copper? If so, then that leads to a fork, which gives you access to globally compliant documents where we have them, because obviously we're not going to have everything up, for, up front, but eventually there's going to be more and more of those forks available to the users, but those forks only pop up in relevant transactions. So if instead of copper, what you're looking for is, uh, I don't know, cotton or, or, or rather um, something more uh, mundane, um, uh, some kind of you know, corn, um, it's uh, not that I have anything against corn or that I, I, I use mundane freely <laughs> for that. But if you're tracking that, then obviously the origin of that is going to be 
either a separate set of documents or not relevant to the particular transaction. However, whether that corn has been grown uh, with, um, uh, ah, the French word is bio, but in English it's... Organic. Organic, yes. Is that corn organic or not? And is that stipulated with the proper certificate? That will be in the fork. Okay. So that's something that we're, we're building as, as, as we progress. And, and we are um, uh, looking to team up with the International Chamber of Commerce for a lot of these global templates, along with a number of other uh, international organizations. Does that answer your, yep. your question? And, yep. and I guess I mean, your system is pretty um, open to growth because you're not limited by a finite structure that's set on the onset. Like you can add to it as needed. That's nice. That, that, that is the idea. Yeah. Because we're also, we, I mean, the, re the reason we use the word partnership is, is very much because of its two way nature. Um, it would be presumptuous of us to just go, we know exactly what you need. Here it is. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, no, um, that's perfect. And 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 you know, over time, things you know, regulations change. Um, one thing that can happen, for example, on a platform like this, is um, we're going to have a number of different countries. Some of these countries, for international uh, rules and regulations, may not be allowed to trade with each other. So, for example, if you're in the U.S. and you're looking for a provider of um, some kind of machine parts, uh, you won't see anyone from Iran. If that embargo is lifted, the next search you do will have those Iranian manufacturers. That's very but cool. overnight, if new, you know, the Russian conflict, right? Russia, if Russia is on, on Mariado, um, we may switch off those accounts or the visibility of those accounts overnight. However, we, will, we may switch their access to the outside world, but within Russia, they may continue to use Mariado for their business. So we are not political, we are compliant. You see what I mean? Yep. Uh, sorry, sorry what was that comment? Lamborghini? I... It's a new. No? Le... You don't like it? This is a lead car. Adnan, I'm not sure if you were talking to me about a Lamborghini or to someone else who was much younger. <laughs> it's like, that kind of also protects me from accidentally doing trade with countries that I might not exactly. want to yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, How does Mariota always... sound so far? <laughs> Sounds cool. Okay. So per I'm, perhaps, uh, uh, sorry, I'm go biased. ahead. Jeff. I'm a nerd, I'm a nerd, so I'm biased in that regard, so. Uh, you're amongst friends. <laughs> we, so, uh, we, I... we share the same hairline as well, so I, I, we're on the same page. Ah, uh, there we go. It's uh, nowadays it's like having a cape. <laughs> well, it's the rock, you know, the rock is yeah, the one who made exactly. it all. He's a he's grass, really... grass, yeah. grass doesn't grow on a busy street, right? Okay. Well, I call, I call Patrick, <laughs> and then Patrick Stewart is the bald father. He is the bald father to us all. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. So, as, I, as, um, as we come as we come back to the top of the hour, I just want to point out one, one quick thing. We're very happy to discuss any further um, uh, questions you may have. Uh, if you want to send us uh, emails, I'll just um, pop those up for you to, uh, to see. And um, I, I would say also that there are some things of merit of specific to chambers that we didn't address here today, but that may be very, very interesting, such as the, the revenue streams it can provide. And there are some things that are more specific to companies. So feel free to uh, reach out to either Jerome or myself with, with those questions uh, in, your, in your own time. Be happy to answer you. And I think with that, we can head over back to you, Todd. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nicholas. Uh, we still have a few more minutes. We will close at uh, 9 o'clock. Are there any further questions for uh, Nicholas uh, or Jerome? Uh, with respect to the transactions, uh, uh, I think I want to recap uh, next steps or outcomes, uh, mm -hmm. any direction that those on the call here have uh, for the Brampton Board of Trade. Should we pursue this? Uh, um, I, I, uh, any other closing thoughts, comments, questions, smart remarks? <laughs> Hi, Todd. Hi, Hi. go ahead, Odin. Hi. Go ahead. Yep. Um, just um, Louis Lucas, uh, Brampton Board of Trade, I'm one of the directors. You mentioned sort of your targeting and, and probably rightly so as you get this off the ground. In terms of validity, 
Uh, I won't go into that as a lawyer. Validity is, is sort of is key and trust is everything. Um, and, and uh, you know, typically, uh, typically we we go to other law firms for the validity uh globally um uh but in and you mentioned that you're you know you're 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 looking at chambers and i i i believe um you mentioned that you're you're talking about sort of federal chambers so here i am on the board of trade and we have a a great a great board and we have many smaller members that may not be members of the canadian chamber of commerce and you know in canada there's provincial chambers of commerce and there's your local ones such as the brampton board of trade um, um in terms of validity for the smaller chambers, um, you know, I, I think there's some 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 validity that can be found at a federal level. But when you start dealing with members who are not necessarily members of a Canadian Chamber of Commerce, but perhaps a provincial or local one, have you sort of given that one any thought and how that fits in? Yeah. So there's two aspects to that. One is the the situation where the local chambers are members of the national one. And then there are situations where they are independent of the national entity and they operate of their own accord. In the first instance, we start with a partnership at the national level and we go through that to then extend that partnership to the local chambers that are members of that national chamber. So in essence, the, the, uh, the vetting process kind of trickles down. And, and that then reaches the end users, which are usually members of the local uh, chamber rather than the national one. But it also encompasses those who are directly members of the national. In the second um, situation, it's just as valid because what we're looking for is a, a, uh, a vetting process applied by a board of trade or a chamber for its members. But it is somewhat less flexible because of the, the smaller scale. It means that we, we need to uh, uh, basically present the, the terms of the partnership and it's, and it's a yes or no decision. Um, so, and, and to be fair, Marietta may not fit every, every model and we respect that. We're not trying to be the only platform. We're looking to enhance what is already there. And, and in fact, if I may use your question to, to address another important point, we're not getting in the way of chambers and what they do. We're merely adding a layer to what they do. So when it comes to referring businesses, chambers will always be a trusted, uh, a trusted entity to do that. But there, not only can you recommend the company, but if that recommendation sticks, transaction can follow straight away on a platform that you are a member of. So that merely extends the, the opportunities you give to your members. And I'd like to close by saying, all this is at zero cost to chambers, no financial commitment, no risk of any kind, and an additional revenue stream. But that's for another conversation. Thank you, uh, Nicholas. Uh, um, and in terms of magnitude for participation of a, of, of a company, um, in, in terms of the affordability, do you, do you have a, a rule of thumb before we finish of uh, what it might cost to participate once you launch? Oh, it doesn't cost anything for for uh, for chambers. For companies, the, the the we are currently looking at three different types of subscriptions. Either you stay a free member, you have <coughs> access to the platform, but in a limited capacity in terms of the number of products, for example, you may post or the number of transactions you may carry out per month or quarter. And in that case, you would pay a, a small percentage fee on any transaction you carry out, but that's it. Then if you want to move to something a little more um, uh, complete and comprehensive, you have a basic profile uh, that you can access for uh, 150 euros a year or 15 euros a month. And that gives you no transaction fees, no fees on any third party services, and an additional range of, um, uh, of services such as you know, rich content for the description of your products and such, uh, and such things, as well as additional kind of services like you have access to ratings that people can put on you as you can carry out a transaction. You can build a track record that way and so on. And then finally, we have the top end subscription level, uh, which is at 40 euros a month or 400 a year. And that gives you unlimited access to everything. 400 a year. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Nicholas. Uh, uh, an appropriate way, I think, to finish, uh, just to reinforce the point that 
uh, your uh, uh, platform, your proposed platform is uh, affordable, deals with complexity, uh, uh, makes things easier. It's definitely a source of uh, competitive advantage and we wish you well as uh, you. Uh, you continue uh, your conversations with uh, companies, trade uh, manufacturers, exporters, chambers of commerce uh, around uh, the world. I hope uh, everyone uh, uh, was as uh, um, impressed as I was about the mind opening, uh, the, uh, the possibilities uh, that uh, blockchain and leveraging the trust of blockchain and the trust uh, of chambers of commerce, when those two synergize in what Marietto is proposing, uh, it certainly uh, uh, shows a pathway for a very exciting future. So we look forward to learning uh, more uh, about Marietto as you uh, develop. If you have uh, follow-up questions, we have the contact information for uh, Jerome and Nicholas uh, on uh, of the screen. And um, I want to thank them both for their very succinct and uh, appropriate uh, uh, presentation and a very uh, interesting presentation uh, today. I'm going to quickly uh, finish by saying, you know, uh, we're in the middle of uh, uh, an invasion of uh, Russia into Ukraine and uh, trade, chambers of commerce, their history are merchants of peace. Trade can bring about uh, peace. And uh, certainly it's exciting to see uh, what uh, the use of new technologies uh, can, uh, can do to, uh, to, to achieve that goal, as well as to uh, help uh, businesses uh, here in Brampton, Southwestern Ontario, Canada, uh, prosper and uh, those prosper around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, speaking of prosperity, uh, March 17th, uh, we have our Prosperity Network, eight o'clock. Uh, I do encourage everyone to attend. Uh, we have a special guest, uh, Peter Veltman, who is the uh, Financial Accountability Officer for Ontario, the province of Ontario. Really interesting presentation about uh, investments and forecasts in terms of healthcare and, and uh, 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 gasoline prices and all of that wonderful stuff. So hopefully we'll see you back here on uh, March 17th. Our inaugural Energy and Environment Forum occurs on April 21st. There will be some great speakers, including Ontario's Minister of Environment, uh, David Puccini, as well as uh, Coca-Cola, Canon, Sheridan, talking about various aspects aspects of uh, uh, reducing carbon uh, footprint. Our Business Excellence Awards are happening on uh, May 5th. That includes the awarding of the 2022 Business Person of the Year to Heather Stratty. Heather, we're looking forward to partying with you on May 5th. Uh, uh, we also uh, have a number of other awards uh, that uh, uh, require your nominations. We Nominations are growing. Nomination deadline is next uh, week, uh, March 15th, uh, for uh, new categories in trade, in smart solutions, in innovation, in customer experience, and we do uh, encourage uh, your uh, participation in nominating a customer, a supplier, uh, yourself uh, to uh, um, these very prestigious awards. Ladies and gentlemen, I uh, want to thank uh, MNP, Sharag, Amanda, uh, Alice, uh, Ty, thank you so much uh, for uh, your uh, sponsorship of our Innovation Network. Thank you for attending uh, our Innovation and Trade Joint Network today. Nicholas, uh, Jerome, uh, thank you for your insights. Thank you for all of your questions. And if you have other questions uh, about this or about the Board of Trade, please feel free to uh, reach out. We look forward to our next conversation. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bye-bye.